I, I want to enlist you to be part of the solution. Yeah, that's why we're here. I'm white and I've got everything I need. No one clutches their purses when they're in a room alone with me. And I can drive for any neighborhood I please. At any hour, and the police don't do a thing. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I got everything I need. I'm a guy getting paid more than a girl with a degree. And I can walk down the streets after dark, no one wants to rape me. And I can get a girl pregnant and just as easily flee. Just like my straight white male dad did to me. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need I've got a pile of broken mirrors And I'm walking under ladders And I'm spilling tons of salt But to me that doesn't matter Cause my skin and my gender and my orientation Are the best things to have if you live in this nation I recommend it highly See a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Shit's gonna work out for me Cause I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need all right, everybody, welcome to the Intellectual Dollar Tree. We usually do this show at 7 p.m. Pacific right here on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. But it was over 100 degrees in Fremont today, so uh, no 7 o'clock start time. Thank- thankfully, I'm in this room that uh, actually has a fucking uh, a large portal to the outside. Things are cooling off pretty well. Um, <clears throat> thanks real quick for um, Media Wench, DJ Dub D, and Fuzzy Simba for uh, subscribing. Thanks for the raid as the show started, Justin. Appreciate that. Um, and uh, I guess we're going to get going here. Uh, for people listening on the podcast, you're going to be hearing the red light uh, version of the show, sort of. We'll do about an hour and we'll, we'll play the song and whatnot, but I encourage you to head on over to YouTube or any other place to uh, grab the video of this because a lot of what's going to be happening won't make sense uh, just listening on the audio, but I thought it would be fun to do a uh, red light on the main feed right now. Um, and if you were to go to YouTube and find this, you would see that the lights are red and that's why we call it red light. That's like that song Roxanne, but none of us can sing. So, Oh, also of course is listener supported uh, programming. Um, if you would like to support this program, you can go to uh, patreoncom slash echoplex or eplex.store and um sign up the five dollar a month level and you'll get all our podcasts sent to you the day after the the recorded and it'll include red light so um just because it's just red light doesn't mean we're not going to do some weird fucking content i found this guy his name is doug popst p-o-p-s-t and um what i learned from perusing his channel is that this motherfucker does not like weed like does not like weed (laughs) almost all his videos are about how weed is bad so, um, somebody else we've been covering lately, Dr. K healthy gamer, uh, went on there and, uh, so the, the title of this video is even a little bit of weed, alcohol, porn, and social media does this to you with the healthy gamer. Dr. K welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Doug. I'd love to jump right in. I'd love to get your thoughts on like, why are you start with a bong hit alcohol and, and Netflix so alluring to people that have deep rooted emotional pain and that's such a complex question i'd say globally uh, you know so you said something about what was it oh, something about pain like deep-rooted emotional pain yeah so i think the number one reason that all these things are rising is actually because there's a blindness to our internal emotional experience so a lot of people aren't even aware of their deep-rooted emotional pain in fact that's half the problem so the, the situation right now is that we're going through life and our attention is externalized way more than it ever has been. 
So when I was like, oh, thanks for gifting a sub to Justin Freakin, uh, Media Winch, and you have continued the scam train for people that are uh, listening on the podcast. You'll just have to look it up. It's a hype train. It's a <clears throat> way that Twitch tries to gamify things. A medical student, you know, I was so focused on productivity. So I would like listen to a podcast, right? Like healthy podcasts, like good podcasts, like this one, where I'm going to learn something. Dude, this podcast then, probably only tells you not to smoke weed. And I would, I would do that while I was like, you know, cooking or cleaning in the morning. And then I'm listening to a lecture on my way to the train and I'm reading stuff on the train and then I'm getting distracted on my cell phone. And then I'm listening to a lecture the whole day. Our mind is outside of ourselves. And we have such good ways to numb our internal emotional environment. And if you look at everything that you mentioned, the one common neuroscience or one of the common neuroscience pathways is that they suppress our negative emotional circuitry. So when I'm feeling bad, if I watch pornography, it'll make those feelings go away temporarily. So but wait a minute, what if you're Christurbating? We'll do it. Getting caught up in a show will do it. Playing video games will do it. Marijuana will do it. So just like anything entertaining, fun, or um, any just kind of distraction, anything you do that you enjoy is bad, I guess. So, so what's actually You just sit there and fucking on. meditate all the time. You can be fucking, you can be like in touch with your emotions and in touch with the universe. Numbing ourselves to our emotional problems. As we numb ourselves to our emotional problems, those problems pile up. And then we need more numbing agents. So this is why we're seeing not just people getting dependent on one thing, but we see that the average person is utilizing all the things are bad. There are no good things way more. And that's because of this cycle of not actually dealing with things emo like emotionally or even problems in our life that create emotions, right? We just have numbing agents. We engage in a lot of avoidance. So we're seeing all of the things that allow us. So this is really interesting, though, because he keeps he keeps doing these long interviews with people where uh, aren't people shouldn't the people that are watching his interview instead of watching his interview, shouldn't they be like fucking meditating and focusing on their like internal internal fucking well-being? <clears throat> like, why are why are any of these people even watching Dr. K? Avoid while still enjoying ourselves. Right. Because normally when I avoid my problems, it creates problems and it does create problems. But this way I can forget about them for a few hours at a time. And then I can switch to something else and forget about that for a few hours at a time. And so I think that's kind of the big global impact. And all these things that we're, we've talked about are so normalized now. I mean, Ooh, this, uh, these assholes all have the same mic I do. But if you notice there, none of them have the XLR plugged in. They're all running it over USB because they're because they suck. Alcohol. I mean, screens, porn. And I feel like a lot of times what happens is people are okay with using these because there's no like short term problems that come from these things. Like, I mean, most people in the short term, their life isn't going to fall apart from using these things. But I know long term, they can be very detrimental. Like, what is your message to people that are casually using these things to check out from their life and dealing with the internal stuff? Okay, so. He, they, they are including like watching a show on Netflix. Motherfucker, people just sometimes want to sit down and watch TV. I'm not, I don't, I'm not even big on TV, but after the show every night, I sit down and I fucking watch like an old episode of Boston Legal or fucking start binging The Wire again or find something new to watch. Like it's fucking, it's what people do when they're like done with their shit because they could just sit and watch something for a while. And you're not tuned out. If the thing is good, you're paying attention to it. You might even learn something, even just from like a fictional show, you might learn something like what the fuck? Like, what are they not aware of? I think, like you said, so, so if it's a long-term consequence, so let me ask you, Doug, if it's a long-term consequence, let's say I start using marijuana today and four years from now, I'm stalling in life, right? So we see this picture a lot, a lot called fascist, very stalling. I'm just like addicted to nicotine. Can't speak 66 positive momentum but then after college or in the middle of college like you don't really get a good job and you don't progress in life but four years from now you feel kind of stuck how do you know that marijuana is the cause i don't that's the problem right wait, that's the wait a minute what if you're just stuck what if shit just sucks what if like <clears throat> what if like you're <clears throat> at a job that like pays your bills or whatever but you're not very fulfilled from your job you don't you don't have the time or the confidence to go find another job you maybe just got out of a relationship that wasn't that great. Anymore. Fucking what does weed have to do with any of this stuff? These are all like a lot of this stuff is circumstance. Right. 
So, so this is where. Good job, everybody. Good job bad, participating no in the hype train. Consequences, but how do we even know that marijuana is the long term consequence? So I think the biggest challenge that people face is that we are very good at seeing short term consequences. And this is the way that our brain works, by the way. A and we're very poor at seeing the long term consequences of our actions, because even for the person who is using marijuana, if you ask them what's wrong in your life right now, they'll say that X, Y, Z is wrong, but the marijuana doesn't appear to have a direct effect on it. And that's the biggest problem. And so what are your thoughts is on marijuana as a whole? Because before we were recording, I was mentioning that, you know, one of my big passions is kind of showcasing the fact that marijuana isn't as good for people's mental health as the internet may present it to be. What are your Could you just call it weed like a normal person? Your thoughts as a psychiatrist, as an addiction expert on like marijuana and the brain and mental health? Yeah. So, so actually, can I, can I uh, add one more bit to that last question? Sure. So I think that what I would say to people, if marijuana is contributing to your life being poor, how would you even tell? Right. That's the question. The same question that I would ask you and I would, I would ask them. And if their answer is, I don't know, then that's a huge problem because this is something that could be negatively impacting your life, but you may not be able to see it. And so then that becomes really, like, really tricky. Like, isn't this supposed to be academic? If this is supposed to be academic, shouldn't they be calling it cannabis? How do you know? Because if it is a problem and it is keeping you stuck, you wouldn't ever be able to see it, which means that you're never going to fix it, which means that your life will continue to stay exactly the way that it is. This guy, they talk about people smoking weed like everybody's the media wench, just be chief in like five joints during a four hour stream. Like I smoke weed and I fucking... Meaty Wench gave me five joints. They'd last me three weeks. Like everybody's like consumption is different. And there are people who should not be chief in five joints in four hours, but there are some people who it's fine. Like this is like just assuming that it's like an on off switch. You either use cannabis or you don't. And that's dumb. Yeah. If I smoked like a bunch of weed, if I smoked like a lot of weed during this, in fact, people have been here when I smoked a lot of weed on stream. It's not great. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not at my best when I'm super high. Actually, what it requires is a period. But also you notice they're not bringing up, I mean, it says alcohol in the title, but alcohol is way worse than weed. Like it's just way worse than weed. Snarly P, thank you for following. Did period of sobriety as an experiment. What will happen to your life if you stop marijuana for like six months to a year? We're not talking 30 days. We're talking six months to a year. And if someone is not able to engage in that experiment, then that is a sign that there's a problem. What if they don't want to? That's really how long it takes in my experience to, to really get out of a substance. Now you're, you're asking, what do I think about marijuana? So I think there's a couple things to keep in mind about marijuana. So I think any substance or anything in the world, doesn't matter what it is, has certain good effects and certain bad effects, right? So I, and I, I know this sounds weird because even working as an addiction psychiatrist, a lot of people are anti-marijuana. There are some studies that show that marijuana can be beneficial. So one study of people who are dependent- God, imagine getting stuck with this guy when he's high. If you start using marijuana, you can cut your opiate dependency by about 50%. There are some studies, I've had some patients who have been able to use marijuana in a somewhat healthy way to manage, for example, like some aspects of depression or bipolar disorder or anxiety. Um, and, and, you know, some people really find <clears throat> that it uh, fucking a good sativa helps me sleep. I think the challenge is that a lot of the things that people think marijuana do in a negative way is not what I usually Isn't microdosing just making sure you don't take enough acid to actually feel anything? So some people are worried. They'll say like, oh, like marijuana will make you like stupider and it'll lower your IQ. There's one study, for example, that shows that marijuana is associated with a four to eight point decrease in IQ. But if you- I mean, how high are you when you're taking the test? You know, people will say, but there are lots of very successful people who are super smart who are still using marijuana. Fair enough. There are other studies that show that it doesn't have too much of an effect. So there are a couple of things to keep in mind when it comes to marijuana. The first is that... The so he just said nothing. First of all, like IQ, IQ, so far as I can tell, is just the results of your uh, performance on a specific series of tests on a specific day. And he said that some studies show that that reduces your performance on those tests, and some studies say that it doesn't. So nothing. He just said nothing. Good job. Thanks for saying nothing. Many of our studies on marijuana did happen before it was criminalized, at least in the United States. 
around the 60s and 70s. The marijuana that we get access to today is not the same substance that we got access to 60 years ago because the potent- Well, no, weed from 60 years ago would dry out and be kind of nasty. The has increased very, very uh, intensely. So the THC concentration, some of I think the- I never hear that, I've never heard of that Acapulco gold. So we see a larger effect. So some of the studies that suggest that it's safe, we're talking about, you know, like, you know, two ounces of beer versus two ounces of liquor is a very different thing. And marijuana used to be the concentration of beer, and now it's the concentration of like hard liquor. Yeah, but that's the thing is most people, two beers and two ounces of hard liquor, or depending on the alcohol content of the beer, they're going to be more or less equivalent. And so if we go out, and the media went just drinking red beer and I'm drinking cocktails. If we go to the place where we know the bartender, that bartender ain't putting just one ounce of vodka in my drink. But let's say we don't know the bartender and it's like one of those kind of stingy places where they use that fucking mechanical thing to make sure you only get an ounce of vodka. I have one vodka or two vodka tonics. Media Wench has two red beers. We've had about the same amount of alcohol. Now I drink more than the media wench, so she will probably be have, getting a little bit warm in the face a little more than I am after two drinks. But it's the same thing. Most people don't drink vodka, or don't, especially vodka, actually, don't drink vodka straight. Second thing is that there are a couple of real big problems with marijuana. The first is that it really is a gateway drug. No, it's so not. Especially when you start Cigarette, alcohol is the, gate, alcohol is the gateway drug. I mean, anything's a gateway drug, because if you're going to, I think that it's like, if you're inclined to try to change your head, you're going to be inclined to try to do whatever's available, and it's just that uh, cannabis is more readily available, even before it was... Uh, before it was legal. One of the biggest problems that I see is that marijuana alters your reward circuitry and your vulnerability to other substances. It sensitizes your dopamine system so that your dopamine system becomes more vulnerable to other addictions. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to, where did you hear that? Things like video games and stuff like that. And literally like, like I've never heard that. I've never heard that in my life that, uh, that cannabis, kind of rewires your brain and makes it easier if you become addicted to other substances or activities. I think like playing video games high is way more fun than playing video games not high. Is that what he's talking about? I think that's what he's talking about, right? We we had, it was like Mario Kart. You should only play Mario Kart if you're really stoned. What does that mean? Employment that you get from video games will become altered. The anticipation that you experience will increase the craving that you will experience will actually intensify. So when you use marijuana, it becomes harder to resist cravings for all other things because it literally alters your, your, the chemical structure of your brain and your neurons and stuff in the nucleus accumbens. There's very good evidence for that. Is there? So it's not so much the direct effect of marijuana. We'll, we'll get to those. But it's that it really makes it, it gives you a handicap in dealing we played, with- we were, I was only good at Quake 3 when so I was frying. One thing. Okay, so marijuana is not the same concentration. Second thing is it really is a in case drug stream. in a negative way. The third thing that I really tend to find when I work- Mario Kart, yeah, I have an emulator. The reason that marijuana is a problem is not because it's harmful. The reason that marijuana is a problem is because it's helpful. So the, the hardest patients that I've had to work with as an addiction psychiatrist are not the ones where they use substances. So Adam Todd Brown has a podcast called, um, it's just Conspiracy the Show. And they did a really good podcast about how it's like kind of annoying to talk about MK Ultra because people like anytime like a celebrity just glitches out, like, you know, sometimes like, you know, if you're even if you're used to talking to people, if you're on a stage and you're accepting an award or whatever, you sometimes forget what you're going to say. The lights are distracting. Maybe a friend is waving at you or something happens that's like not what you expected to happen. Everybody goes, oh, it's MK Ultra. And then that sounds crazy. And so then people just assume that that's what MK Ultra was. It was a really good fucking podcast. Adam Todd Brown's podcasts are all really good. It's their life wonderful. The hardest uh, cases to kick are when they use. Yeah, I want to. I, I asked to get on his show, and he has a pretty like he has a pretty cool thing going on. He's like, hey, you're not part of like the LA like scene. He's like, if you're doing your show out of LA, I would definitely think about it. He's like, but I just have people on from LA. He's like, people from LA, and if anybody that ever worked for me at Cracked, and those are the only people I really have on. And he was like super nice about it. It's just like how when we did Local Love, like if you were, weren't going to interview a band from out of the area unless they happen to be on tour. So pretty cool. If normal. And this is very true of marijuana. 
So when I work with people who use marijuana, the hardest cases are not, oh my God, I love marijuana. I love getting high. We're going to like celebrate and have fun and we're going to vibe. It's when I smoke marijuana or when I use marijuana, I get to live life the way that normal people do. I Wait, what? No. No. uh you get high and go to the grocery store. Normal people don't don't be like, should I buy all of the Snickers? I don't even eat candy. Should I just buy all these Snickers? Ordinary life. I get to hang out with people without crippling anxiety. I get to be able to go to sleep at night like other normal human beings. Oh, stealthy fetish. This is the real challenge. This is why it's so good and why people like it so much is they do detect that it helps with things like social anxiety. It helps with things like sleep. And if you were to ask someone, hey, I'm going to give you two options. One is you can live a life where you don't get to sleep very much and your sleep is crappy and you get to wake up exhausted every day and you don't get to form social connections with people. You don't get to hang out with people. You don't get to date or you get to do all of those things. All you have to do is use marijuana. And by the way, it also enhances the pleasure of things like food and video games and sexual activity. Which one would you pick? Right. This is oh, and pick smoking weed is that it helps people live what they perceive to be normal lives. And in many ways, it does help them live normal lives. So the challenge, though, is that when we start using marijuana to help with those things, he is the guest. He is the guest. Media Wench. There is somebody else on this show. He is the guest. Um, we're, maybe we'll take it uh, during the during the post or the part where I have to cut off the podcast. Maybe we'll take, a, take another a look at another interview of this fucking host here who just fucking I guess the only thing about him is that he hates weed. Weep. But it alters your sleep architecture, it alters your REM sleep, it alters your sleep cycles, and makes that sleep less restful. No, it doesn't. And it also creates other kinds of problems. Like okay, so why isn't he talking about alcohol? Dude, one of them, like if I notice, like after the show, if I have like, if I have more than like two or three cocktails, like during a show, and I'm, I notice that I'm in like buzzed, I like, I'll stay up late just watch tv until i can feel like i'm not that buzzed anymore i'll make sure i eat something make sure i drink some water because if you go to sleep like even just buzzed that fucks your sleep up hell bad anxiety and over time you develop tolerance and it it really it, it's sort of like a double-edged sword is is really what i see which is what makes it so dangerous thanks for the follow-off right once you have something that becomes an easy way to fix a problem then you stop focusing on fixing the problem in a more long-term or healthier way, right? The moment that I use marijuana every night before I go to sleep, sleep hygiene becomes less important. And so the, the real challenge with marijuana is that it allows you, because it works so well, it actually allows you to propagate. So this is a little bit Scientology adjacent, right? Because let's say you, we were to just insert any other medication for any other condition here. Right. If somebody's using a probably indica or maybe indica gummies or you know some kind of some kind of cannabis product, just a, a little bit of it because it helps them sleep. Maybe even maybe even just um maybe even just um, um, um oh what's the name of that? Not THC. The other can can cannabinoids. Fucking I forget what it's called. Um, because <clears throat> I don't use that shit. I that's like weed without the weed. Yeah, CBDs. If somebody's using CBDs. So Scientology would tell you that if you have to use medication for any condition, that you're <clears throat> not taking care of the underlying problem and that you need to go to Scientology for some kind of treatment for the problem. And it's not too far away from what this guy's saying. Unhealthy behaviors. Since it helps me relax and socialize, I don't ever build up my social skills. I don't work on my confidence. I don't go to the gym. I don't learn how to talk to people. because the Going to the gym doesn't that. help you socialize. And don't so try to socialize at the gym. It's just, it, it's the uh, taking the elevator instead of taking the stairs. So it works in the Sometimes it's 10 flights of stairs. Time, it's going to make your life harder. And is the same true for alcohol? Like, I mean, when I heard you describe like the life of, you know, getting high on marijuana and how you're able to date, have fun, socialize, be with your friends, fall asleep faster. I feel like you're also describing the allure to alcohol as well. Absolutely. Right. So I, I think in al alcohol in some ways I think is like almost more damaging Oh, it's so, so almost, I mean, oh, I'm sorry, almost more, da almost more. Alcohol is associated with liver failure, heart disease, liver failure, heart disease. Um, I forget uh, the diabetes. It's, it's associated with diabetes. It's, uh, and let's, let's not even talk about drunk driving. 
What do you mean almost worse? And I drink. I drink more than I smoke cannabis. But I'm like fully aware that it's bad for me. Clear relationship between alcohol usage, numbing our emotions, especially things like sadness today, but worsens our mood over the course of the next week in the next month. So I think alcohol in some ways is like worse in the sense that the, the negative health impacts are, are quite profound. I don't know how to say this. They're more immediate. and they What was cut out there? Potent. But alcohol absolutely can serve as a social lubricant. You know, I've, ev I've even done like couples counseling where like the reason that these people got married in the first place. Well, it depends. It depends a little bit of booze. Yeah. If you're like, if you're like buzzed, you've had a few drinks and you're out and you're having a good time. Yeah. But if you're an, if you're annihilated drunk, you know, it's no longer a social lubricant. Your friends have to take care of you. Now your friends can't even fucking go try to get laid at the club. Like it becomes the opposite of a social social lubricant if you just get absolutely shit faced. This is because of alcohol. It was the only time I ever got mad at my last long term boyfriend, Rory, is maybe one in ten times we'd go out, he would just overdo it. He would just get absolutely fucking blitzed. And it wasn't that I like cared that he wasn't any good to like fuck or whatever when we got home. It was just that like now me and the people we went out with and stuff were kind of keeping an eye on him. And that sucked. I didn't get that mad because I've done that too. But I mean, it was, you know, it was one in 10 times we went out and we were going out three nights a week. So it was like maybe once a month. And, and, you know, it's such a foundation for their relationship. Two people with social anxiety get together. They both enjoy drinking. They both have somewhat of a biological predisposition. And then when one of them gets sober later in life because it's causing all kinds of other problems, it really creates problems in their relationship because it is the foundation of some of their relationship, right? They, for their honeymoon, they're going to go like on a wine tasting thing in Napa Valley and all this kind of stuff. So it's absolutely true. I'm sorry, that's just like normie behavior. Wine tasting. These people are, get the fuck out of here. This is just normie behavior. All as well. Do you think people's lives will get worse faster if they abuse alcohol compared to marijuana? I mean, that's such a dangerous question, but my gut instinct is yes. Like alcohol will screw up your life. It, this is just what I've seen as a clinician. So this is an anecdotal experience, right? So, I mean, just simple things. So, if we look at like, you know, health consequences, it, it's not just that it'll happen faster, it's that it'll screw you up more. So, you know, hepatic steatosis liver cirrhosis, drunk driving, alcohol withdrawal can be fatal. Whiskey Whereas dick. Marijuana withdrawal is not fatal. Alcohol intoxication is much more likely to be like physically damaging and can be fatal. Whereas marijuana intoxication is, has a much less likely chance of doing so. So in fact, we don't, I don't think there's ever been a recorded case of cannabis directly killing somebody. So from a, I mean, I guess you could just stuff it down someone's throat so they can't breathe toxicity which means the toxicity to your actual cells i think that alcohol i mean we've got some strong evidence that alcohol in that way is worse some strong evidence it's, you know, it's, it's it's not just strong i mean this is the, this is just a few what is he doing it's not that he it's not that he likes alcohol i bet this guy like uh, this guy drinks this guy has like a wine cellar with like a bottle of wine that he is waiting for the extra special occasion to open and and stuff this guy just hates weed or he knows that his ho the host hates weed all the people who like marijuana listening to this are going to be like, yay, I'm in the same. It's okay. I told you so. No, that's, that's really what I meant is that I think alcohol will screw your life up more because it's like the, the, the argument is always like, well, you, I've never heard anybody's marriage get ruined because of X, Y, and Z, but alcohol has certainly destroyed marriages or the driving part or just the, how, how intense it is. And I think it's like, it's so odd to me that it's become so normalized socially because it's like we wouldn't do the same thing with something like heroin and, and heroin and alcohol. I mean, in my my opinion, I don't I mean, part as far I, I don't know why. I mean, he might be just be on vacation, but also like close the blind. I don't know. Bring a ring light. It's also like the lighting is so bad. It almost looks like the room is hot boxed, which it clearly is not. It's like the danger, the potential dangers of, of abusing them. I think you can absolutely make that argument. I know one of the things you talk a lot about is porn and how it impacts the brain. I mean, I think people, maybe a lot of people might not understand, a lot of people might not understand like why people are so drawn to watching porn other than the fact that somebody might be like lonely, single or whatever. But I forgot horny. You say that porn really does a fabulous job at turning off our negative emotions. Talk about yeah, Avalon and Babylon wouldn't even remember that, that they had a popcorn machine if they weren't high. 
and why that's just so attractive to people that can't seem to deal with their emotions? That's such a great question. So I, 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 this is a question that I was wondering, right? So we're seeing in our, in our community. I mean, are we talking about like somebody who just watches porn occasionally, or are we talking about somebody who's like gooning? And I was like, what is going on? Like, why is porn? Like, what's going on? So I, I sat down and I did what, a, what I was trained to do, right? Which is any, any good act. I sat down and I did what, a, what I was trained to do, right? So you jacked off some pornography? Which is any, any good academic doctor is trained to find answers in the literature. So I went to the, the scientific literature and I tried to understand, okay, which parts of the brain are affected by sex, right? So... And then this is, this is the cool thing is like when we look at things like, uh, you know, substances of abuse, something like alcohol. So alcohol will affect our GABA receptors. Opioids will affect our mu receptors, kappa receptors. THC will affect our anandamide receptors. There are very focal parts of the brain that are affected by substances. So I was trying to figure out. Remember when eight, oh, we got, we got, a, we got a, a video banned from uh, TikTok. Remember that fucking when HK was like, this guy doesn't even know how to goon. Wow, uh, TikTok fucking... They didn't, they didn't like ban it, but they refused to show it to anybody that didn't go to our profile. <laughs> it's the porn receptor. And that's where what I discovered is if we really stop and think about it, sex and procreation is arguably the purpose of the human organism. And so every part of our brain is involved in sex. Literally every part of our brain, every, every neurotransmitter if you look at sort of the neuroscience of sexual arousal, sexual engagement, bonding, all that stuff, every part of our brain is affected. So what we see in pornography, and if we kind of think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, like, you know, there's a reason why people can be in like heart failure and still engage in sexual activity, like especially men. And like the, the gonads still produce sperm, you can still get somewhat of an erection and you can still get like some kind of ejaculation. So our body is willing to sacrifice so much to preserve the ability to procreate. So it is a very, very, very um, important evolutionary goal. So the, uh, Alfredo, so I'm actually, usually this would have been the main content of the show and I would have just had, I would have ignored you because we're doing the podcast. But people on the podcast, Alfredo in the chat said, I think weed doesn't have the stigma of uh, being as addictive as alcohol. Um, I don't. Well, I think that the, on that, I think that the, the, the research shows that it doesn't cause the same kind of dependency that alcohol does. I have some friends that are pretty high functioning when they're high and, and you are uh, looked down upon when you drink. See, I don't think that's the case because there's bars everywhere and cl nightclubs and fucking there's this whole like snooty culture around wine and an expensive whiskey and shit. Um, that's just like, but that's just the circles I travel in because I've entertainment and I like going out and stuff. Um, I would rather get high than drunk. Yeah, me too. Uh, no, I'd rather get, uh, well, I'd rather just, I'd rather have a couple drinks than get stoned, but that's different. I think the message might not be for you because you seem chill here. Chill. Healthy gamer is pretty cool though, though. Definitely isn't saying he hates weed here. No, the other guy his uh, the guy interviewing him hates weed. A healthy gamer. I, I think I could make a pretty good case that the healthy gamer is a giant piece of shit. Um, there's a series of interviews he did with, um, and I forget the guy's name, the guy, and the guy was deeply depressed, thought that he was, thought that he was getting therapy from, um, Dr. K over a live YouTube. And then the, unfortunately the, 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 the poor man who was clearly in crisis ended up taking his life own life. And at no point that I could tell, and nobody else could tell did a uh, healthy gamer, Dr. K here tell the guy to go talk to somebody like in real life, go talk to um, a therapist and who wasn't broadcasting this person's struggle uh, onto YouTube. Um, does anybody remember the guy's name? We were talking about it a couple weeks ago when we started going down the Dr. K rabbit hole. Does anybody remember the guy? I, Redolent was his name. Redolent, something like that. That poor man was so, I watched some of it and I had to turn it off. It was the, one of the most horrifying things I've ever seen. I was like, Ooh, should we watch some of this on stream? I got 20 minutes into the first one and I was like, I shouldn't even be watching this on my television. It was so intensely irresponsible. So intensely irresponsible. And just so like, and he was, he was like collecting money. People were donating like 50, a hundred bucks a pop while he was like putting this guy's mental health crisis on display on YouTube live and Twitch. 
I'm stunned that Twitch didn't kick him off. It's fucking, it's fucking disgusting. Fuck Dr. K. He hasn't apologized for it. And what pornography basically does is take advantage of this. So if we look at the effect of pornography, I think it's far more whole brain than something like marijuana or alcohol. And this is what we tend to see with all of the behavioral addictions. So these like he did substances. fucking other fucking inappropriate things. Like he invited the guy to go to Japan with him and shit, dude. And it's just, it, it, this was like kind of popular streamer. So the guy was making enough money that he could definitely go to Japan. But like, it was just a fucking highly inappropriate. But this also happens with things like video games, where there isn't a discrete part of the brain that lights up. We see a more diffuse activity all across the brain. And if we sort of think about it, right, the drive to procreate is so powerful that when you get aroused, you stop thinking about all kinds of other stuff. This is why. Yes, it's called being horny. We call it thinking with your dick. Yeah. Like what? It, like I. Alfredo and I, I'm, you're new here. Um, we don't usually pick on the newbies too much, but I, I feel like, I feel like what you're saying reminds me a lot of what people were saying about Jordan Peterson, a, like four or five years ago, before, before Jordan Peterson fucking got his brain scrambled in some Russian rehab. People fall in love. They make yeah. It was wreckful. Right? Yeah, because it was horrible. What happened? To, like all of your horrible. brain becomes aligned. Or didn't? Yeah. Or they were thing. just hiding in a basement. You're thinking about it a lot. You're obsessing about this person. You're falling in love. We romanticize this, but there's a neuroscience component to that, which all gets activated. What up, sock now? So pornography is one of these things that is just such a potent stimulus that is so easily accessible, and furthermore, doesn't frequently come with the consequences that we're talking about. See, no one gets cancer from watching too much pornography. No one gets lung cancer. No one gets liver cirrhosis. You know, no one goes through like, you, you know, seizures when they're withdrawing from, porn from pornography. So it doesn't come with some of these consequences. And yet it activates, it really suppresses some of our negative emotional circuitry. It gives us spurts of dopamine when we, when we orgasm. Um, even if you look at uh, some of these. But wait, just masturbating without pornography would give you spurts. <laughs> He said spurts. Yeah, they would give you skeets of uh, skeets of dopamine when you are, when you get yes, yes, that's what masturbation. Is, is, do you think what the fuck, dude? Ancient yogic texts. They say that uh, orgasm is a state of temporary enlightenment because if you really pay attention to the state of mind and orgasm, you have no thoughts. Right? It's a moment of pure bliss. So if you kind of think about people who get addicted to things like ropamine or alcohol or marijuana <laughs> what are they trying to do rose and ropamine get away from their thoughts they're trying to get away from their mind and the moment of orgasm is a very powerful physiological and neurological way to get out of all that stuff so it, it, it's just a very potent kind of physiologic neuroscientific tool to help us feel better so then would you say there's a big misconception that people think that the majority of people who are watching and engaging in porn are just unhappy with their sex life, they're feeling lonely, they're, they're not um, you know, in a relationship, and, and in fact, the reality is it's just giving them this massive cure to all the- Like people watch people. porn for all kind of, I don't know, people, single people, married people, people in relationships, and other people, asexual people that watch porn. I don't know, man. People just fucking watch porn. Sometimes you just want to watch some porn. I'd say yes and no. So you're, you're, you're absolutely right that I think it is, it is solving more than loneliness for sure. But remember that, see, see, this is the problem. With no, nobody porn. thinks that they're going to watch porn and not like it doesn't solve. It doesn't, doesn't, I don't think it makes you any more or less lonely. You're just watching a, an adult film logical interventions that we have now pornography video games whatever social media i want to see a simple story the about the pool about the pool attendant because they scratch an evolutionary itch so our brain has a desire for relationships we have all kinds of circuits in our brain that measure our social status compared to other people they can induce anxiety they can help us feel comfortable there's this stuff is very deeply wired the problem with technology is that it gives us a shadow but it does give us something. It gives us a shadow of what the real world provides. 
So, you know, I have relationships with people online that I would consider very real friends of mine. I'm Yeah, one one of them you gave fake therapy to and monetized it. Told didn't tell him to get a to go talk to <clears throat> uh, somebody in person or to call any kind of uh, crisis hotline and then unfortunately all, all by the way, that Reckful guy, I, I did look at some of his content. Fuck it seemed like a very nice guy. Seemed like a very good person who just needed some help. And instead he came across Dr. K. The Decoding the Gurus episode about that is fucking heartbreaking. I couldn't listen to all of that either. Emotionally bond with these people. And so I can get some, some very real value out of this thing. The problem is that it never gives us the complete real life version. So just if we look at friends, for example, I can talk to my friends online and I can, we can work through a breakup together, right? So let's say I get dumped and, and they provide emotional support. That's very real. And if you look at, for example, the social networks of gamers during the pandemic, gamers were actually resilient against the early stages of depression and anxiety because we actually had a social support network that was virtual. So we were fine. Not but like, <clears throat> but we, it's not just gamers. I think I me and the media, we're fucking prolific trolls and we have all these people some of them hang out here uh, like ali drew uh Nin ninja rv who doesn't hang out as much but a lot of family obligations also i think he's a professor now good for him um fucking uh, justin we met trolling like matt bender in the majority report people michael richards who hangs out here we met trolling sammy who used to hang out here a lot we met trolling like we had this we had a network of people to chit chat with too it's not just gamers it was just people who were engaged in any kind of online community, maybe had a little more resilience and had more people to talk to at the beginning of the pandemic. But also, like, I don't know what the fuck he's talking about because, like, I saw people, I, me and my neighbors, almost every night when that, when every evening, as soon as like they were the stay at home uh, suggestion happened, one of my neighbors, the, the guy up and diagonal from me, just put a bunch of lawn chairs out in front of the, uh, it was in a fourplex. He put a bunch of lawn chairs out and just, knocked on everybody's door and walked back and said, Hey, you guys want to come out here? You smoke some weed, have a beer, and sit a few feet away from each other and maybe hang out a little bit. That was great. People did that. The people at the park all the time, like there were people out doing things that just wasn't, they just weren't inside at the bar. Yes. The challenge though, is if you look at that online relationship, I can't get everything. So when I hug another human being, I get a release of oxytocin. That makes me feel good. It makes me feel bonded. It makes me, it alleviates some degree of stress, but you can't, you can't hug yourself. Pandemic was very real. Can't so speak. Something that's always missing. We know you want to get kicked out of here again. One of the things we have to do here is moderate the chat. You can't spread. <laughs> yep. Goodbye. So this <laughs> all the things like, fuck with this. Something like pornography. That person probably holds and, the and record for having been kicked problem, out the most not times. Just with pornography, but w with some of these like social social media aspects of pornography like OnlyFans, because now we're seeing the development of parasocial relationships. So it's not just the direct neuroscience. Yo, effect. yo, my last shorter term boyfriend, Marcus, does OnlyFans. Uh, one of my new friends in Fremont, he does OnlyFans. I helped him get his cameras set up. Like, there's nothing wrong with this. This is just sex work. This is sex work where that takes out some of the, the risk inherent in meeting strangers for sex. Of sexual activity. Now I can interact with this person. I can get their attention. I can pay extra money to have them call me out specifically. At the beginning of a video, they're going to say, hey, I made this for you. And that scratches more itches in the brain. So we're seeing that pornography is evolving. And I think as it scratches those itches, as I'm getting my needs. Fail troll, right? Pornography, that will propagate my loneliness. Because just like marijuana or anything else, I'm not actually fixing those problems in, in my life. So it creates this kind of dependency that keeps people stuck because my brain is not, I don't know if this kind of makes sense, but see, if my brain gets none of its needs met, it will work really hard to get its needs met, right? So if I'm absolutely starving and absolutely like thirsty, I will do whatever it takes. But if I have something that gives- Sometimes if I'm, if I'm thirsty in the middle of the night, I won't even get out of bed. I'll just fall asleep dehydrated. Some amount of water then I will never be desperate enough to actually fix the situation because I'm getting enough of it kind of handed to me in a very easy way. And that's what pornography does. So I want to dive into like things like social media and even like Netflix, because what you just Netflix. Said about, so now it's just like, like don't even 
what are you supposed to do? Can't goon, can't smoke weed. I don't know, I didn't lean too hard in the drinking. I think you can drink. Now you can't even watch a show on Netflix. Being it like this instant fix, right? And dealing with loneliness. I think social media can certainly do that too. Like a personal television, just broadcast television. You, it's, you could, you had to, you, you could channel surf. I knew a lot of people that weren't really watching TV so much. It's something to do. They were channel surf. And my dad still channel surfs. Video does really well. Like I get this massive dopamine rush. And then if one doesn't, I'm like, oh, like bummer, right? And I think that's common amongst people in the content creation space. And I also know people that when they are lonely, because of the fact you can just binge Netflix shows, you could sit there all day and check out and just watch like your favorite show over and over again for days on end. So do you put now I feel called out. <clears throat> I took I took a night off of streaming once to finish because I was like, I was like, I got eight episodes left of burn notice. I can bang these out tonight if I take the night off of streaming. <laughs> stuff like that in the same category as porn in the way that it impacts the brain or is it slightly different? I would say it's different. So so some things are similar and some things are the same, right? So so it's not going to engage all the same circuits uh, that pornography does. It, it'll activate one time. It was but I think it was see, especially with things like only might have been a year ago blending, right? So there's a social media I'm entitled to a night off. Fuck you. But as you mentioned, so social media activates all kinds of other circuitry. So there's this kind of, uh, see, human beings are acutely aware of like what their status is in relation to other human beings. And this is what social media really like picks up. The media ones will just fill in if I need the night off. No problem, baby. The challenge is that in the past, we had no way to quantify our social status. Like I didn't actually have like a social rating. But with the creation of things like social networks, we can literally quantify how much people like you. Right. There's like a literal button called a like. And that is something that that is very, very like addictive in, in this in a sense. Right. Because now we know exactly what we need to likes, you say. Twelve likes, twelve motherfucking likes do to get more likes. We have a quantification of something that used to be like hard to understand. How do I get more people to like me? What do I do? It's kind of confusing, but social media really taps into that. So what do you think is the remedy or the solution for all of this? Because as some- Yeah, do you have just a solution? He's going to say it's fucking like Ayurveda or some shit. Who's been in recovery for over 15 years. I know that substances and external things like we've been talking about provide this I'm an immense amount of value to our lives and they're highly addictive and the feeling is highly addictive. And at the same time, the further down- the addiction path we go, the more shame we develop and the lower our self-esteem becomes. So now you're at this horrible crossroads where you're highly addicted to something that makes you feel really good and you feel like crap about yourself and you have no confidence in your wave of psychotherapy is the incorporation of certain like Eastern concepts into clinical treatment. So we have these things like dialectical behavioral therapy, which includes a lot of mindfulness. We have things like, um, acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a very good uh, evidence-based treatment for addictions. And so we're starting to incorporate some of these Eastern concepts. And I think the most important thing is that if we look at what all of these things do, what they do is externalize our attention. We spend less time with ourselves and we spend more time with the outside world. And this is creating all kinds of other problems that we haven't even touched on. See, when I'm not in touch with myself, I don't know what I want, right? And if I don't know what I want, what I end up doing is looking to the external world, looking for successful people. And then I, I say, okay, well, this person is happy. This person is successful. That's what I should do. And then we start to do that, but we don't actually feel that internally. We have, we have a question mark in here and we're looking for answers on the outside. And then once we start duplicating what that person is doing, then it doesn't work the same because the, the, that person was passionate. That's why they got there, but I'm not passionate. I'm just mimicking what they're doing. So this is kind of what ends up happening is we're, we're kind of directionless in life. We don't really know what we want. And then in that directionlessness, our brain is kind of like, why not get some dopamine today? Because I'm not working towards anything in particular. And if you look at the, there's some really interesting multivariate regression analyses on risk factors for pornography addiction. So what, what do you mean? What are risks? Does, does he just mean that you're horny? Pornography addiction. 
And the number one thing that that I, I, I've sort of found in the literature, the literature doesn't say necessarily that this is number one, but this is what I think is really important. And there's very strong correlation is meaninglessness in life. And, and you know, I, I know you struggled with with substances in the past. And if you really like look at every single person who's overcome an addiction, a big part of it is you have to have a really good reason to. You have to care more about fixing the addiction than what the addiction provides. And right now, we're such a purposeless society. It's like, what do I, what do I want to accomplish a year from now? Who the hell knows? Right? And then we go on like replacing, finding this answer, finding this answer from the outside, but we're not in touch with ourselves. And so I think the most important thing that needs to happen is we need to get back in touch with ourselves. Stop running away from our emotions. Connect with what we want. Because when I work with people who are addicted to pornography on any given day, it's just not worth it to avoid porn. It's not like they move towards something significant. The cost is not that high. I might as well watch a little bit of porn, maybe jerk off a little bit, maybe masturbate a little bit. And then those are the same thing. What do you mean? Maybe I'm going to jerk off, then I'm going to masturbate. Then I'm going to tug on the pug. I can go on to the empty life. You know, the life is empty before and the life is empty after. There's no cost really. And so, so a big part of it, I think, is just re-internalizing our attention, connecting with ourselves, becoming like grounded. And this is something that I think is incredibly important because technology is only going to get more addictive. Like it's not like some one day, some platform is going to wake up and say, oh, you know what? This is addictive enough. On the contrary, they're all competing for our attention. What's happening right now is all weasel the weasel are trying to pull users towards their platform and pull people away from other platforms, which is what they're designed to do. I mean, I, I don't think that that's evil. It's just, you know, anytime you have a marketplace, everyone wants you to use their product. That's their goal. The problem is no matter which platform wins, you lose because you're losing the attention no matter what. So what we really need to do is reconnect with ourselves, spend a little bit more time with ourselves, learn to work through emotions as opposed to numb them right? Try to figure out what we want instead of letting social media tell us the ways in which we're deficient and how we can spend $59.99 to fix that problem, right? This is exactly what's going on. And so what we really need to do is get connected with ourselves because even social media will create things like body dysmorphia, right? There's, there's a really disturbing trend that we're seeing where body dysmorphia used to be more common in women and we're starting to see equality between what men and women. And men have a lot more body dysmorphia than I think historically they've ever had. No, this is, this is, <clears throat> men have always been insecure <clears throat> about our bodies and relationships and stuff. It's just that things are getting a little bit better slowly, but surely things are getting better and men are able to talk about that stuff more. We're making our, our sense of self is being dictated by what we consume from the outside. It's not being developed from in here. We've talked about how a lot of these substances and things can lead to being addicted to, to the other things that we've talked about, like porn can be intertwined you know, with like weed and video games and alcohol. And they're all, they all can be connected somehow. As far as the solution, well, they could all just be discrete things that you part partake in connected to ourselves and developing some purpose in life, which I know is incredibly important. There's also a lot of been a lot of talk about like dopamine detox. Do you think given that these addictions are can be related? Do you think it's important for somebody to essentially just detox from everything and, and really focus on finding themselves? Or do you think that they can be, there can be a happy medium with like watching like some uh, content like you and others that. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. He's like, yeah, you should, uh, you shouldn't be spending so much time on the internet watching YouTube or anything, but what you should be doing is watching hours and hours and hours of me going on uh, different people's shows. People overcome addiction. Yeah. So that, that's a great question. So there are a couple of different, let's say like neuroscience, Psych psychiatric things going on. Okay. So the first, let's talk about dopamine detox. So see when we use any kind of substance or even activity, our brain will develop tolerance and we will need a higher signal. So if we look at something like pornography, what we tend to find is that over time people will watch, will change the way that they watch pornography. Pornography consumption tends to get hardcore over time. So things will become more extreme. And that's because in order to get the same stimulus from the brain, so when we get some amount of stuff, and it's the same thing with like caffeine or alcohol, right? So at the beginning, like I'm a lightweight and two beers will get me drunk. And then like as I develop physiologic tolerance, I need three, I need four, I need five. Same thing happens with video games. So if you pay attention to people who play video games, the first hour or two that you play is really, really fun. 
And then the subsequent hours that you play are less fun, but you can't seem to stop. So when we talk about dopamine detox, what I, the way that I sort of think about it is resetting your sensitivity to dopamine by abstaining from certain dopaminergic activities for some amount of time. That can be very, very helpful. It's basically resetting your neurochemistry. But I'm a big fan of not abstinence when it comes to behavioral stuff. So when I work with people, so abstinence for, from things like marijuana, alcohol, opioids, caffeine, go for it, right? You don't need that stuff to survive. Caffeine? Things like behavioral Excuse addiction. Excuse you. Like sex addiction or social media addiction. Unfortunately, we live in a world where these have become part of life. So I was talking to a second grade teacher and they told me that 100% of the boys in their class play Fortnite. So if you're the one boy in the class who does not play Fortnite, you are denied a social experience with your peers. So it's here and here to stay. So this is where I think it's fine to detox for a while. And there are some places out there that will do this kind of like, you know, the, these video game addiction like rehabs where they, you have 30 days of sobriety and it's built on the sobriety model, which I think is fine. But then the problem is when these people are done, like they go back into the world and like sobriety is hard, especially when it comes to technology. So our approach is, is to teach restraint instead of restraint. Alfredo, just drop that link in the peanut gallery. That's like the general chat. Develop an we'll watch it after we take a break in a little bit here. With yourself and to get your psychological needs met in real life so that all this stuff becomes you ever tried caffeine so I on weed because I was addicted to video games and I still play video games and I teach my kids how to play video games, but there's a healthy way to do it. And the core problem with a lot of these things is that they start to become the primary source of the way that we get our needs met. So that if my main method of managing my emotions is playing video games, then anytime there's negative emotion, I have to play video games and that's going to create the cycle we talked about. So now, for example, I go for a walk every day. And if I go for a walk every day, I don't listen to anything. I don't talk to anyone. I just let my mind run. Yeah, I wouldn't want to go with a <laughs> kind of weirdo goes on a walk with someone else and has a chat. And it thinks through all the problems that I have. And over time, I kind of calm down. And then I feel emotionally better. And then you can play video games. Fine. And then I'll come home. I'll settle whatever I need to. Then I have play video games for a little bit. And then I'm, it's fine. Going for a walk is nice, but he makes it sound horrible. Calibrate. Absolutely. But I think long term, we need a sustainable way to live our life that is not, does not fall victim to technology. See, we should have enough resistance to it to where we don't, we, we don't need to avoid it. We can manage it. So I know you found a lot of purpose in your pain and your past and your experience with video game addiction drives a lot of what you do now. I'm curious, like what were video games doing for you as a kid? Like what, what pain, what problems were they numbing for you? Yeah. So I, I think uh, boredom. they were doing a lot more than, than numbing my problems. So I think the first thing that I did, I, I realized I played now, wing commander was, because I, I started, had played wing I, commander I when I was a kid. Early I was on, good as fuck at that game. I know a lot of like type A parents are really proud of. They're like, oh yeah, my kid is smarter than all the other kids. I think that had a, a, a lot of damaging effects for me. So the first thing to, to understand is that when you're in school, your social status, usually at least when I was in school, as a boy relates to your physical capability, not your mental capability. If you're the smartest kid in the class, you get bullied. You get called teacher's pet. The kids who have a high social status. No, no, that's if you're being, are but like they're just kids, and, kids are going to you know, tease each other for fucking get the fuck out of Yeah, Kids are going to tease each other, dude. The beginning of PE class. You Adults tease you. We all tease each other here. There's two team captains. Your social status is determined by how quickly you get picked for either team. So I was the last kid to get picked because I was a year younger. I was a five-year-old competing against sometimes seven-year-olds. Like, that's crazy. Like, there's just no way you can win. So I, I grew up in a, in a scenario where I could not compete. Right? I was just a loser, like objectively, all the time. I would be at the bottom. So video games offered me the first avenue for a level playing field. Because if I was playing a video game, a five-year-old can beat a seven-year-old with like enough practice because it's just cognitive. It's just reflexes. So it allowed me to get some degree of social identity. Wait, wait no. <clears throat> I mean, five to, there's, a big, there's a big jump, five years old to seven years old, playing something like basketball. But a really good five-year-old could probably whoop a 
regular seven-year-old's asset basketball. What happened was that I found school to be incredibly boring because school moves at the pace of the slowest kid. And the cool thing about video games is when you beat level one, level two is waiting for you. When you beat level two, level three is waiting for you. So I found a constant. So the smartest kids I knew, and I wasn't one of these kids, the smartest kids I knew were trying to help the other kids, actually. I wasn't one of them. I mean, I was generally ahead, like ahead of the other kids. And one year I was in the gifted class or whatever, and I thought it sucked. And I told my parents that it sucked because <laughs> fucking all the regular kids were in the regular class. And so my parents told the school to take me out of the gifted class. And I mean, I don't know. I'd say I turned out fine, but um, I'm almost 50 years old and I stream for a living. So maybe not. Well, challenge and engagement, which I absolutely fell in love with. So this is where the roots of my addiction were formed. It allowed me to compete against my peers. It allowed me to feel challenged instead of bored. Later on, what ended up happening is that, you know, I started to do poorly in life. And then I fell into this trap of like numbing my emotions by playing video games. And I, I remember like when I would go to bed uh, when I was a freshman in college and literally failing out of school, like it hadn't happened yet because it was mid semester. I remember going to bed and realizing like I'm failing out and there's like nothing I can do about it. Like I felt completely powerless. So those thoughts would come roaring back when I went to sleep. And I would feel so guilty, feel so powerless. It was just so painful. So the only antidote that I had is I had to play video games until I was so exhausted that I would just pass out the moment that my head hit the pillow. So the only way, and that video games are good at that. Like there's, there's even a, you know, a case from 2012 where someone died of a cardiac arrhythmia after gaming for like 60 hours straight. So they can suppress your physiologic. But it signal. wasn't the video. <clears throat> it was like they were drinking like, they were drinking like hell energy drinks. For a long, long, long periods of time. And so then what would happen is since I would play to the level of exhaustion, then I'm going to sleep at 4.30 in the morning and then I'm sleeping through all my classes. It makes it impossible to wake up. Now there's another day that I've slept through all my classes. My grades have dropped a little bit more because I'm after the fourth day of class that you miss, you lose like three points on your final average and, and things like that. Like it was really terrible. And so then I just got stuck in this cycle where like the only thing that I could do to avoid my pain was play video games. And then it even reached the point I was so desperate that what I would do is sneak when I went home for, for like a break after the semester, I would sneak out in the morning and steal my transcript from the mailbox so that my parents didn't see it. And then my parents would ask me like, where's your grades? And they're like, I was like, oh, they send them at the end of the year in college. It's different. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I was just delaying and delaying and playing tricks and playing video appear after some number of years. And, and so at, at that point, you know, we kind of had a conversation about how I was stubborn. And so what's the difference between stubborn and perseverant, right? If you win in the end, they call you, they say, oh, look at this person has perseverance. My pain was play video games. And then it even reached the point I was so desperate that what I would do is sneak when I went home for, for like a break after the semester, I would sneak out in the morning and steal my transcript from the mailbox so that my parents didn't see it. And then my parents would ask me, like, where's your grades? And they're like, I was like, <laughs> in oh, case anybody on the uh, pod is wondering, this is in fact like, live. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I was just <clears throat> delaying, and delaying and playing tricks and playing video games and, and screwing up my life. I've heard you say that your journey began at failure. A lot of people's journeys end at failure and they give up on themselves. How did you use you know, failing out of college and your experience with what you just described to propel you to do essentially what you're doing now? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the first thing to, to keep in mind is, see, what's the difference between a failure and a setback? If, if it's your last data point, it's a failure, right? Because that's when the game is over. That's when it's a loss. But if you keep going afterward, it's a setback. So also, like, I, I remember when I was applying to medical school for the third year in a row. So I'd been rejected from about 80 medical schools at this point. And, and my uncle came to me and he's like, bro, you got you to gotta think about doing something else. Maybe get a PhD, like maybe do something else because this isn't working. For two years, all you've done is apply to medical school. And you haven't gotten into a single one. Like, I don't know that third year is going to be any different. 
right? Because those Fs from college stay with you. It's not like they disappear after some number of years. And, and so at, at that point, you know, we kind of had a conversation about how I was stubborn. And so what's the difference between stubborn and perseverant, right? If you win in the end, they call you, they say, oh, look at this person has perseverance. If you lose in the end, they call you stubborn. Or if you quit, they call you stubborn. They were like, you're so stubborn, you should have. So this is really bizarre. Where stubborn and perseverant are the same, setback and failure are the same. There's no such thing as a failure, in my opinion. There's just what happens, right? And then there's what you do with it. So this is where I, I think for me, it was a big part of it was just sort of recognizing this, that this is my life. This is what happened. It's neither good nor bad. It's made me the person that I am today, which sounds really, really confusing. Right? So people will say like, what do you mean there's no such thing as failure? There's literally an F on your transcript. And this is where I didn't understand this, but there was no scenario in which I thought an, a failing out of college is better than getting a 4.0 GPA. You ask 99, 100% of people, I imagine they'll say 4.0 is better than 2.0. Except what's really bizarre is now a big part of my brand is that I went from failing out and graduating with a 2.5 to training and teaching at Harvard Medical School. So like this is the one scenario <clears throat> where I'm not a 4.0 kid. I'm actually a digital. Oh yeah. When, when the, <clears throat> so when the stream drops and you're on the app, getting it to come back is very hard. On the browser, it's a lot easier. Who the Twitch app sucks. And that's all a part of my journey. And so for other people out there to recognize that your failures turn you into the person that you are, do they cost you certain things? Absolutely. Will they make your life difficult? Absolutely. There's no question about that. But we even know from, from studies on things like peer support, that if we look at things like especially like sobriety, I can train at the best institution on the planet and become an addiction psychiatrist, but there is no, there is something that I cannot provide for my patient. Thank you for the resub. Sorry for can. ruining your name, but it's a right? joke so at this point. Hopefully you do well on Plinko. Ooh, you got robbed like. on the Plinko. And there's no substitute for your experience. So even your failures turn you into the person that you are. And I think at the end of the day, the only thing that you can do, whether you succeed or you fail, the next day you wake up. Your options are very simple, right? You can just keep continue going. Whether you fail today or you succeed today, the way in which you keep going may change. But there's only one direction to move. Life is going to move you forward whether you want to or not. Time will tick whether you want to stay in the same place. So just focus on moving forward and that's all you can do, whether you get a setback or not. So do you think success can be unhealthy? Because I think of what the opposite of failure is, it's typically success. And I've, I've, I heard you when you were describing the level one, level two of the video, playing the video games. I think people do that as well. They're like, okay, I want to make $100,000 a year. I do that. Now it's up to 150, 200, or I want to get X amount of followers or progress like in, in my career at this corporate level or whatever. Do you think that like success can be addictive too? 100%. So just ask ourselves, right? Doug, can you think of anyone who's very successful who committed suicide? You can. Yeah, right. So everyone yeah. can. It's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you, you look at all these people. We definitely need $33,000 a month. Like, that is uh, correct. Uh, you know, ask yourself, how many of them do you think are happy? Right. How many of them engage in unhealthy habits? So there's even studies that support this. So I, I went to medical school at this place called Tufts University School of Medicine. And then I did my psychiatry training at Harvard. And what I found is that at Harvard, there's way more imposter syndrome than there is at Tufts. I did my undergrad at University of Texas. I didn't really know what imposter syndrome looked like back then. But generally speaking, the higher you climb, the more vulnerable you are to imposter syndrome. Yeah, yeah. You think that you, yeah, that, I mean, this is <clears throat> obvious. You think that you don't deserve the success you've had. A lot of people think that. All kinds of negative things. Sometimes I wish more of the people we cover on Wednesday would get a little bit more of that ye olde imposter syndrome. That can come with success. We can get imposter syndrome. We can develop ego. We can develop what you just pointed out as well, which is this concept of moving goalposts. So if my goal is 100,000 and then do I get content at 100,000? No, now it's 150. Once I get 150, is that enough? No, then it's 200. So there was a period of time where in my private practice, 30 to 40% of my, my patients were in finance. So these were people at like Goldman Sachs and like making millions. Oh, so you're rich as fuck. Of dollars a year. And they were still very unhappy. So you can chase success and there's objective uh, value to success. I'm not saying don't be successful, but I think what makes something healthy or unhealthy is not success or failure because we just talked about, and it's a beautiful question from you, right? So if failure can be healthy. Can success be unhealthy? Absolutely. 
So the main thing is who's in control. So there's no such thing as healthy emotions or unhealthy emotions. What makes an emotion healthy or unhealthy is who's in control. So if the sadness is in control of you, then it's going to be unhealthy. And this is where we can even look at things like excitement and love. Aren't those good emotions? Well, it depends on who's in control. If I've been married for 15 years and I have two 12-year-old twins and I fall in love with someone else, is that love a good love or a bad love? Well, that depends on who's in control. If well, no, sometimes that shit just happens. Excited about this thing. Oh, I want to learn to play guitar. And then I order a guitar off of Amazon and I buy all this sheet music and things like that. Is that good or bad? Well, it depends. Who's in control? Uh, so the guitar. If the, if the success first. is in control of you, which I tend to find for a lot of people happens. The so that's so, that's so verse, verse, verse. Uh, the one thing that I haven't heard anybody say is that his, uh, that he lies about his CV or whatever. You are the more likely. <clears> and if he had, people would have brought it up by now, you know? That the way that you feel about yourself, your, your sense of identity, you can't stop. You can't be at peace. Because if you are unsuccessful, then you become unhappy. And now what's happened is that your unhappiness is not yours to control. It's controlled by the outcomes. So I worked it's with an generally, athlete. Your, your happiness is generally controlled by the outcomes of the things in your life. And I think that's as good a place as any to uh, cut this off for the podcast listeners. So check this out, podcast listeners. We're going to give this show away as a freebie. You can go to patreon.com slash ecoplex or eplex.store and go to the membership tab. And uh, this one will be free. Uh, but while you're there, think about signing up at the five, 10 or $20 a month level really helps this show out. Um, so we're going to take a quick break here um, just so it's easy to cut. Uh, we're going to play Boomers by Periscope. I'm going to come back. I don't even have to change the color of the lights, but I am going to pour myself a cocktail because uh, my internet dropped a couple times and I need a drink. Although it's so fucking hot out that I'm probably after I have a drink, I'm going to be like, oh, I shouldn't have had that drink. Anyway, I'll be back in a couple minutes. Everybody enjoy boomers. <laughs> 